So I want to welcome everybody to today's uh, seminar uh, for the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems. I'm Andy Miller. I'm uh, technically in charge of the seminar series uh, currently, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jacqueline Gill. Um, Dr. Gill is an associate professor at the University of Maine. She has a joint appointment in the Climate Change Institute and the School of Biology and Ecology, and her group investigates the influences and inter interactions of climate change, extinction, and people in the prehistoric record to inform fundamental questions about biodiversity and conservation. She's also the co-founder and co-host of Warm Regards, a podcast about life in a warming world. And she's gonna to talk to us today about a topic that has a very interesting title. Rather than read it, I'm gonna let her go ahead and post uh, her slides and you'll see the title there. And she can um, go ahead and uh, start to discuss this with us. Before, before we do, I'll just let you know, for those who have questions, um, what we'll do is have you post questions in the chat but we will then invite you in the order uh, the questions come in to unmute yourself and actually ask your question live. The, the chat is mostly just so we know who's got a question because it's easier to keep track of that way. And then, then we'll call on individuals to, to, to ask their questions. So uh, without any further ado, Dr. Gill, please take it away. Great, well, thank you so much for uh, that introduction and for this invitation to chat with all of you. I'm really excited um, to be back at a geography department, which is where I came from. Uh, my master's and PhD were both uh, in geography. And uh, so I, I was really excited to be invited to talk to this audience. And also, um, it's, it's uh, this is the first time I've, I've really given this talk. Um, it's a work in progress and I love any feedback from, from, the, from the audience. I also think this is a wonderful audience start with because I think are especially well suited to address the problems of global change from you know diverse and intersectional perspectives. Um, and so this title actually comes out of a <laughs> that I gave in, in 2019. Uh, and it really builds on some of the patterns that I've seen emerging in the broader climate conversation, uh, the, the movement in general, um, both uh, mostly from the sort of activist Side, um, less so from the, the academic side, um, although the academics were starting to catch up. Uh, so something I hear reflects some of the things that I hear from teachers, um, from educators, especially. Of, of, uh, and so I'm really hopeful that, you know, by bringing some threads together um, that I've that I've been seeing sort of emerging from various places, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can kind of create a roadmap um, to to through uh, what is a growing problem in um, but I did just want to start with a, a sort of a positionality statement in terms of what a trained geographer most of my work and my training uh, come sort of from the angle of the earth system. So I am not a social scientist, um, not a humanist, although I try to play well with both of those uh, groups. Um, I'm a physical scientist, I'm an ecologist, and uh, you know a lot of what I'm going to talk about today doesn't have academic expertise. It comes from practice, um, in, you know, being in the world, speaking about climate change, um, engaging in the climate conversation over you know social media, Twitter, podcasting, other ones, um, and just being an advocate and activist. And so. Uh, I just wanted to be, you know, full of um, I'm not someone who researches these questions academically. Um, some of these questions I don't. People are inspired to do that work. Um, and if there are gaps, uh, you know, I'm, I'd am i love to hear about them. So if you're working on these issues or you know someone who is, and I'm not uh, you know, in, in incorporating that work, you're just completely upfront about where I'm coming from. Because there are different ways conversation. Um, you can do it, I can do it from, you know, an activist perspective and, and all of those. Right, so before I talk about I want to trace some of the history of how we got to this moment of, uh, of, of tension within the climate conversation, um, this sort of necessity. Um, and, and you could go back to a number of different points within the timeline, but I'm going to start with 1965. Um, which is really the first time formally that the scientific community approaches the U.S. government um, with this problem of, of climate change. Um, and so you could go back, you know, 
half a century at uh, the report called Restoring the Quality of Our Environments. And this is one of the first reports, or if not the first report, where the U.S. scientific community tells the federal government that, that we are concerned about the impact of emissions on changing the Earth's climate. Um, it was kind of a small moment. It didn't gain a lot of traction, but it was, I think, a, a formative moment, an important one. And it points out that there have, the reason I'm starting here from this position it's, it's, it's recent enough in our memory um, in terms of our relationship with policy that it shows that these conversations aren't new but have been playing out in different spaces and in different ways and then only recently have gelled in terms of a recent um, uh, you know sort of global sense of urgency um, and the types of people who are having these conversations is a theme that I will come back to over and over again in this talk. Um, I will also say that this is very US centric and very um, Western Europe, U.S., uh, Global North centric, um, partly because of the, you know, that's the, that's where I am. This is the space that I occupy. Um, and also, uh, you know, this is where I'm familiar, but also because of the weird and dysfunctional way in which the sort of U.S. climate conversation is, um, you know, both disproportionately influential and powerful, but also very strange globally. It's not this, it's, it's unique. Um, the kinds of conversations that we have here, in the U.S. are quite different from from those that are in you know happening in other parts of the world, and it's just important to remember that this is not a universal conversation. All right, so 1965, we get this report restoring the quality of our environment. Um, it doesn't really get a lot of traction, although you start to see in the ensuing decades the rise of, a, of an environmental movement. Um, you know, the first Earth Day happens after this, etc. Um, really, it's not until 1988 that we start to see some sort of global galvanization around climate change as a scientific problem. We see the the first, the UN forms the intergovernmental panel on climate change. Uh, we start to see sort of a, a together of scientists and policy really thinking about the potential impacts of climate change on a global scale. Um, and then after that, 1997, we see the Kyoto Protocol which was an international treaty that extended a 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that really committed state parties to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so various nations actually came together and agreed to do this formally here in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and then the United States Senate immediately refused to ratify the treaty, um, which represented a shift. Um, I think it's really important to note that prior to this moment, um, in, in, in the sort of early decades of, of our sort of political awareness of climate change, it wasn't a controversial issue. It wasn't a partisan issue like it is today. Um, and that, you know, that shift, that change from being something that everyone was on board with to something that became highly partisan is direct, ties directly back to the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel money um, in politics specifically. And so it's part of a long-term coordinated campaign um, by Big Oil that I'm not going to get into, but folks like Naomi Oreskes, who's a wonderful historian of science and others have addressed that. Um, and actually uh, from the journalistic perspective, check out work by Emily Atkin and, and Amy Westervelt, um, especially the Drilled uh, podcast and um, the Heated Newsletter. So you can get more information about that. Um, definitely check out those resources. But this moment uh, kind of represents kind of a point at which this, this work starts to become really politically divisive. Um, but it still doesn't really gain a ton of popular traction. It's it's being picked up in the environmental movement. I was in high school at this point, um, but it wasn't really something that was on our radar in the same way that it is with today's youth. Uh, then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit uh, to a couple of really formative films that I think um, <clears throat> represent, again, here in the U.S., a shift in the broader public of climate change. Um, the first is The Day After Tomorrow, which um, worked from the you know, program on climate change has found that this has been one of the most influential popular culture um, you know, media that has helped to shift public awareness of climate change. Two years later, An Inconvenient Truth, a documentary film by Al Gore comes out, and people studied this. The, the fictional film, The Day After Tomorrow, did more to move the needle about an inconvenient truth, which really speaks, I think, to the power of narrative um, and storytelling in terms of public awareness. But also, I also think that the sort of idea of, um, you know, and I love the movie, The Day After Tomorrow, uh, but 
I wonder about the role of sort of big budget science fiction apocalyptic storytelling, um, you know, sort of being rooted in this in this moment. So the ways in which we think about the emerging climate crisis from the work of an apocalypse. Um, I wonder, you know, how much of that kind of stems from this moment when this film comes out, because it was so widely watched here in the U.S. Um, and another big shift happens basically in the 2010s where uh, the, the headlines are dominated by, you know, year after year after year of record-breaking temperatures. So we see, um, you know, the last five years prior to, so this came out um, in 2019. So the last five years uh, were the, you know, the hottest years on record globally. That trend has not changed um, going into, you know, last year. Um, and I think, you know, people are starting to wake up to these headlines that every year we're sort of breaking these, these um, global temperature records. Um, and it's, we start to see climate coverage really emerging in the, in the national and international media. And then something happens. There's a watershed moment that happens here. And what's interesting is it's sort of just this year, 2018, is kind of buried in the middle of this, uh, you know, 10 hottest years on record globally within the last decade. Um, but 2018 is a particular watershed moment that I think all of these forces start to come together and, um, and then they start to sort of build on one another. And the first thing that happens chronologically is that in July, 20, uh, July 27th in 2018, um, Jim Bendel puts out a, a what you could really call a white paper uh, called Deep Adaptation, a map for navigating climate tragedy. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that it, it gets rejected from the scientific literature um, because it's, uh, it doesn't pass peer review. And so he publishes it as an open document. Um, and it proposes or presupposes that fundamental societal collapse is heading, right, because of the, uh, some abrupt climate disruption that is on the near horizon. It could happen at any moment. And it's going to trigger this sort of wide scale global uh, societal collapse or civilizational collapse. So we're not just talking about changes in our, our relationship with the natural world or disruptions to our, our you know, economy or food systems or social systems, but we're talking, you know, they literally use words like collapse, civilizational collapse here. And this paper, despite being rejected from peer review is incredibly influential. It's reached arguably an iconic status in this conversation. And it what it does is it prevent, presents the sort of ethical or philosophical framework. It's not actually modeling anything about future climate change, um, but it presents this framework as a way to deal with um, this idea of impending uh, climate breakdown and civilizational disruption, which it takes as a given. And so it starts from this perspective that mitigation alone is not enough to stave off collapse, even if we are to completely hit net zero emissions and add some aggressive solar geoengineering. And in this paper, um, Jim suggests three strategies for us to deal with this impending collapse that's, that's coming. The first is resilience through infrastructure upgrades, which makes sense. This is actually um, adaptation, climate adaptation. Um, but then he goes on to talk about this idea of relinquishment so that we're going to need to give up aspects of civilization that lead to additional climate risk. Um, and, and, you know, a sort of cynical way of interpreting this would be that, um, you know, affluent Western nations with uh, large carbon footprints are basically going to have to, you know, change our lifestyles to be more in alignment with the rest of the world. Um, and yet there isn't a lot of self-reflection about, um, about our own identity, right? Like who he's talking about when he's talking about this need for relinquishment, who's giving up and, and what are we giving up? Um, and then he talks about restoration, which is the return to older cultural values and practices. So this is starting to get to this um, sort of framework of, you know, de urbanization, you know, we, we need to move out to the country and, and practice, you know, more ancient life ways. Um, and again, there's very little, um, it's, you know, it's very romanticized and glorified, but there's very little uh, understanding of what that means, right, in terms of, uh, you know, the like there's there's zero sense of self awareness of you know for example the impacts to indigenous communities um, and so there are a lot of problems with paper um, he updates it in 2020 um, which adds reconciliation which he calls living together in peace so the importance of um, you know, 
sort of, you know, harmony as we move forward into this future. And, and that was kind of a lukewarm response to some of the critiques that came out of, you know, the initial deep adaptation response from the scientific community and, and, and also the activist you know, aspects of the activist community. So some of those criticisms uh, come out of the fact that he, you know, frames near-term collapse as inevitable, um, which, you know, he has, he has uh, addressed to some extent in last year's update. But I think the cat is, is largely out of the bag here. This paper has been downloaded over 800,000 times. Um, you know, it's widely cited among, you know, members of certain spheres within the activist community or even the scientific community. Um, but scientists like Gavin Schmidt and Michael Mann, climate scientists, well, you know, well-respected, um, criticized the scientific foundation of this deep adaptation paper because it fails to account for, you know, global disasters that are already occurring outside the global north or outside the west. Um, and so it sort of, I think, sets a tone for uh, essentially people who are waking up to the climate crisis for the first time because they think it might start to affect them personally. And by people, I mean, largely, you know, people who live in affluent nations. Um, the framework completely lacks climate justice. Uh, and so it, it doesn't acknowledge that the impacts of climate change are felt the first and the hardest by those who have contributed the least. It sort of takes a we're all in this together sort of framework and, and just glosses over the widespread inequalities within you know, climate impacts and also within the, you know, the contributors to climate change. Um, and it's very overly fatalistic um, for a lot of people. You know, they, they've, they've mentioned that it, it removes any hope for alternative outcomes. You know, collapse is inevitable. It is coming. We must prepare. Um, there is no other possible way forward, right? That's the sort of framework of the paper. And folks like Michael Mann and others have argued that it's a pseudoscientific and, and a doomist framing that could, that could lead us down the same path as climate denialism. And that sort of central point is something that we'll come back to over and over again. Um, this idea that you know, there's a growing awareness that this, this sort of doomism could potentially be just as bad or, or you know, even worse than, than denialism because the outcomes could potentially be the same, right? There's a Margaret Atwood quote uh, from one of her novels, um, Mad Adam, where she talks about uh, how when people believe that nothing can be done, they do less than nothing, right? And so it's this sort of idea of if you give up hope, um, you're just going to, you know, continue on with business as usual, or even worse, you know, ramp up your consumption and and uh, and, and harmful activities, um, stop engaging, you know, in society because you don't think that there's a point. So happened in 2018, like I said, it's this watershed moment. Um, we see uh, the emergence of Extinction Rebellion. Um, so the very first uh, Extinction Rebellion protests start happening in in London that fall. Um, and also, um, Greta Thunberg uh, basically goes up on the international stage. She uh, starts her uh, school climate strikes every Friday um, in September. By the end of October, November, uh, there are at least 18,000 students from across the world who are joining her. That continues to grow throughout 2019, right? So 2018 is sort of this moment the public awareness that, that you know, really um, galvanize around this idea of abrupt, uh, imminent, uh, catastrophic, and apoc even apocalyptic climate change. And coming sort of on the heels of, of all of those events is this headline in, in The Guardian, which I would argue has been one of the most damaging and destructive um, articles in terms of the broader climate movement. Um, that's just my opinion. I don't have any you know, data to support that. Um, but the reason why I think it's particularly harmful is, um, is, is this headline, we have 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe warns the UN. This headline came out in 2018, right? And so, um, now, you know, now we have nine years left or, you know, whatever, um, the, the actual number of years seems to shift depending on who you talk to, but it's somewhere within, you know, five to 12. Um, but this idea of thresholds starts to really emerge within the climate movement, um, often based on faulty assumptions or understandings or, or misrepresentations of the science. And what's really interesting about this particular Guardian headline is that it misrepresents the actual UN science, you know, back science that it's represent, you know, that it's, you know, sharing. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind, you know, at the time that this came out, you know, we already are at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. Um, this idea of climate catastrophe is the, this, Point. So, uh, 
the IPCC 1.5 degree um, Celsius report. Um, and so the idea is that if you want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial level, keeping in mind we've already gone there, you know, 1.2 degrees, that leaves us three degrees left, we would have to cut our emissions roughly in half within the next 10 years and all the way to net zero in the next 20 years. And that's a very sort of simple, straightforward math. Um, and the problem with that, with, with sort of taking that report and running with it, is that most of the energy system models that are tasked to try to get there, to get to that, you know, minimize warming to 1.5 degrees with these scenarios, basically decided that it's impossible. Um, mathematically, it just, it just can't be done. Um, and so what they have to do instead is have more of a gradual decline um, where we get to net zero emissions by around 2050 um, instead of you know the next decade uh, and then we make up for the rest by aggressive um, decarbonization so we're sort of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere you know in the second half of the century which isn't ideal um, but it's sort of the the basically what the UN report said was the most likely likely scenario um, and the problem is having this target where we can only warm by three degrees Celsius more than where we are today is you either have to get all of your emissions to zero incredibly fast, like unrealistically fast, given you know all of the challenges that we face, both technologically and, and politically and socially. Um, and then we also, or we, or we overshoot that target, and then we have to suck a bunch of carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and, and to do that, we would need something like two or three times the area of India, of land, just dedicated full time to sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. And so um, that, that 1.5 degrees target, you know, you know, where does that come from? Um, well, it comes out of the Paris Agreement. And... So most of the scientific literature around 2015 and all the discussions that were happening in Paris, um, you know, focused on this idea of keeping warming well below two degrees. And that's because um, a lot of Pacific Island nations started saying, okay, at two degrees, we're flat, you know, this is game over for us. Um, and so from that perspective, it is a climate catastrophe, right? Losing your homes, your ancestral homelands, that is a, that is a catastrophe. Having to move out you know, because your, your, your land is being inundated is 100% a climate catastrophe. Um, and so that's why the Paris Agreement, you know, there's this decision to minimize warming to below, you know, well below two degrees. Um, but again, we're at 1.2 already. Um, Getting to one, you know, getting to 1.5 is within the next 10 to 20 years is is not realistic. It's not going, probably not going to happen. And even the scenarios that the IPCC put forward um, to suggest that as a potential pathway, there's still a one in three chance that we overshoot the two degrees, right? Um, and so there's this idea of of these targets and thresholds that are extremely difficult, if, if not, you know, re like improbable to impossible to reach. Um, so we're sort of set up to fail. Um, and there are these timelines beyond which um, the, you know, the, the media is framing failure as total catastrophe. And, and when I say catastrophe, I don't want to downplay the impacts of of two degrees Celsius on you know cor coral reefs or on you know Pacific Island communities or on people who live in coastal communities, um, harm to you know the most vulnerable ecosystems and human communities globally is going you know is going to be real. Um, but it's that's not the same thing as total global civilizational collapse, right? That where we're seeing billions of people dying um, within a very short period of time. And so this framework, um, this 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe, um, you know, which again, misrepresents some really muddy, messy science. Um, you know, it, it basically gets grabbed and run with in the, within the climate movement. Um, and so now there's this, you know, persistent idea that we're not going to hit that target and therefore collapse is in, imminent and there's nothing that we can do as a result. All right. And so you, you're starting to see things like this. This is, um, uh, a clock uh, in Times Square that um, that basically is counting down literally to the moment, to the second. This tells us how many days, uh, how many days, years, and minutes and seconds that we have to avert this climate catastrophe, right? And so it, the, it's it's being um, interpreted in a very literal sense. Um, and I and I know that you know the role of art is to challenge us and to you know make us feel uncomfortable. But but more broadly, the the climate many members of the climate community see things like this and they think that this is a point of no return. It's framed in that way. And that is incredibly damaging because 
it's very, it's, it's almost, almost a certainty that we're not going to hit that target. Right. And, um, and so you have a lot of people who think that at that moment, things are just going to fall apart. Um, and, and others are sort of taking that idea and thinking, all right, well, there's nothing that we can do. We might as well just give up now. Um, and so what I would say is that we have a new problem on our hands um, as, a, as a, a community of what Eric Taus calls climate people, right? People engaging in the climate conversation, scientists, activists, policymakers. We have grown up as climate people in a world where we thought we were fighting climate denial. And climate denial has been a problem, more so, less so from the perspective of the broader community um, and more so from the perspective of these uh, uh, you know, concerted efforts by the fossil fuel industry to control, at least in the United States, um, politics and to limit um, our, you know, our political engagement and our political will to, you know, to, to make policy changes that, you know, are climate positive. Um, and so we've been trained, to, you know, many, those of us who have been thinking about this for a while, we've been trained to argue with people, to convince them, to shock them, to scare them, whatever, into believing, to understanding, recognizing that climate change is a problem, right? And somewhere very quickly, I mean, and I would say around 2018, we sort of blew past that and, to, and we're now in a completely different problem where we are now fighting climate doom. Um, so doom is, doomism is the new denial, um, meaning you know, we, we no longer are finding ourselves in a position of having to convince people, most people, that climate change is real. Right. Those of you who teach about climate change in your classrooms, you've probably also noticed this, right, that maybe your lectures that you've been giving every year, maybe you only get one day to talk about climate change. Maybe it's an entire class or an entire section. Um, but I'm going to bet you dollars to donuts that a large proportion of your slides of your material is still based on convincing students that this is a problem. And so at some point in the last several years, um, you know, the students who come into my classroom, they're already there. And the issue is not convincing them that, that climate change is real, but rather it's that something can be done about it and that it's not too late and that we're not approaching this point of no return or this imminent threshold beyond which nothing can be done. And you know that's reflected in the trends in public belief in climate change. Again, here in the U.S., um, the this is from the Yale Climate uh, Change Communications Six Americas Project, which is the highest quality data we have about climate belief in the U.S. It's highly granular. Um, it's you know incredibly well detailed, and um, what it tells us is that the dismissives, who we would you know think of as the climate deniers, they are almost the smallest you know, group within the US, they're 8%. And that number has dropped um, from something like 11 or 12% just a couple of years ago. So we're seeing a decline, a steady decline in dismissives and doubtfuls are also getting smaller. Disengaged are folks who are just like, yeah, I don't really care if it's a problem or not. I just have other things going on. Like, you know, maybe your house is about to be, um, you know, taken by the bank or you're having trouble feeding your family or there's just something else going on that's weighing more heavily on you. So there's just, you know, they're like, it doesn't matter to me whether or not I, you know, this is happening right now. I have more urgent things to think about. Um, whereas the cautious, concerned and alarmed group and especially the alarmed group are growing, right? The, the concern used to be large, larger and the alarmed bubble was smaller, kind of closer to the dismissive end. And it's been growing by quite a lot in the, just the last few years. Um, they repeat this survey twice a year you can check at the county level what you know the climate beliefs are closest to you um, and you can also look at those trends through time but you know these national level trends are you know really reinforcing this this growing pattern that um, you know we we are focusing all of our efforts on convincing these people who probably cannot really be convinced through most of our efforts um, that you know climate change is real when the real, you know, ur urgent need, I think now is to talk to these folks and to galvanize them into understanding and believing that their actions matter and that there's still something that can be done um, and that they're not powerless in the face of, you know, of these imminent changes. And so, uh, you know, the new kind of there's sort of an emerging, you know, uh, identity within within these conversations, within these space these spaces um, that Mary Heglar has, uh, who's a wonderful climate essayist, um, has has called the doomer dude, right? It's very typically a uh, white male, um, very often, um, you know, very highly engaged in environmental issues, um, and yet kind of 
comes to this conversation with this sense of there's nothing we can do it's too late um you know we might as well just head for our bunkers in the hills and just take care of ourselves and and you know there's there's almost an evangelical need to convince other people that nothing can be done and i'm not talking about people who are experiencing climate grief there are growing and there's something that we definitely desperately need to, to reckon with but i'm talking about the people who feel the need to come into you know activist spaces or classrooms or on social media or with essays in, in the new yorker to say we can't win this fight there's no point um take care of you and yours uh, and and it's really interesting because you know a lot of these a lot of these people, these these sort of doomer dudes, they seem to have emerged more recently. They tend to be well educated. They tend to be, you know, very comfortable. Um, you know, they're they're novelists like Jonathan Franzen, um, but there are members of the scientific community who who I would classify in the same sort of group. Um, and they're all people who, you know, who have lots of ample, who have ample resources, right? They they can be mobile. Um, they, they are not the most vulnerable. They don't live in the most vulnerable communities. Um, and so, and yet it's like they woke up to this idea of climate change just because suddenly it might affect them personally, right? Um, never mind the fact that for decades now, the impacts of climate change have already been felt in, in you know, very real ways um, within communities of color. Uh, within indigenous communities within the global south, right? And so um, the, the and, I, and I'll say, take a moment to say here that that timeline that I shared with you um, all throughout that process, right? Uh, uh, Pacific Islander communities, um, you know, people of color here in the US and others have been saying, you know, they've been, they've been engaging in activist spaces. They're just not gaining the same kinds of traction in the media and in their sort of broader public consciousness. So it's not like those voices haven't been speaking out. It's just they're not getting, you know, op-eds in the Washington Post and they're not getting articles in the New Yorker, right? And so this sort of, this this emergence of, of climate doomism seems to be happening, you know, all at the same time as, you know, we're seeing this um, increase in headlines um, in the media, but a lot of those responses are, you know, it, it's, it's like it only seems to matter when it affects, um, you know, affluent middle-aged white men, right? And so that's uh, a big problem with the narratives that, you know, we're seeing uh, within the climate movement in general. And so I, I wanted to come back to Mary Heglar just for a second because she's got a wonderful piece in response um, to, you know, she, she's uh, been writing in the last few years in uh, you know various places, and she has a wonderful piece on Medium called "It's Worth It." She, she coined this term uh, "doomer dude." She also in this essay talks about nihilism, like N I H I L I S M, and she says, "I've never seen a perfect world. I never will, but I know that a world warmed by two degrees is far preferable to one warmed by three or six, and that I'm willing to fight for it with everything I have because it is everything I have. I don't need a guarantee of success before I." Everything to save the things the, and the places I love before I have to save myself. So she's writing like a real pushback, a real response to the rise of, of doomism. Um, and, you know, it, I think it's important to, to highlight some of the voices that are pushing back on these narratives. And yet the piece is in medium, right? It's not in the New Yorker. It's not in the, in the Washington Post, you know. So the voices that are being elevated by, you know, the leaders, um, are, you know, not, are not uh, you know, representative of the broader community. All right, so what's the impact of these narratives, sort of doomist narrative? We don't actually know. Um, there has not been much research that I've been able to find on this yet um, in terms of just sort of broader public belief. Um, we do, however, I think partly because it's been so recent, right? It's only been the last couple of years that we've, or even the real, really the last year or so that we've started to see this framework emerging. Um, however, we, I think we do have some ideas that we can draw on um, from other aspects of, you know, psychology research. Um, and, you know, one of them is that, you know, we do know that climate anxiety is you know, well-documented um, within the scientific community. Um, and just thinking about their communities, whether we're talking about parents, teachers, you know, we're hearing from themselves. Um, so, you know, we do see that there, there is an anxiety. How much that translates to action or 
in action. It's hard to say, but uh, um, one of the things I would say is that um, there's a wonderful paper by my own colleagues on the discourses of climate de delay, and they kind of characterize some of these um, responses and talk about, you know, how how harmful that they can be and, and, and equally harmful to climate denialism, right? And so some of these things, um, you know, we have the individualism, right? Someone else should take actions first. It redirects responsibility. Um, we see this sometimes even among, um, you know, climate activists like, oh, well, our personal choices don't matter um, because, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a fossil fuel industry, right? Sort of ignoring that Yes, there are structural problems that are, you know, uh, and barriers that are limiting our individual choices, um, but markets are still out there to produce products that are, you know, that people are, are consuming, right? The, these companies aren't just sort of, you know, throwing, um, you know, carbon dioxide into a machine that spits out dollars, right? If you look at the largest emitters globally, they're actually state-run um, uh, energy companies, right? So it's not, it's not just a simple matter of, oh, it's, uh, you know, Individuals don't matter because it's the it's the fossil fuel industry, right? Um, there's also this sort of techno optimists, right? Um, we don't need, we don't need disruptive change. Science will save us, right? Again, sort of puts off the responsibility on others. Um, and then there's the the folks that are, you know, change will be too disruptive. Um, we don't want to, uh, you know, these large scale changes will be too hard or um, they often use social justice as a pretext, but they're not actually caring for others. Um, and then we have the doomists, right? So it's not possible to mitigate climate change. So we should just give up. We should, we should surrender. So each of these discourses, they're all delaying action, right? They all have the same kinds of outcomes that denial has. And so one potential, you know, outcome of these narratives, you know, like these other um, discourses of, of delay, uh, could be that people might give up, right? They, they might, um, and, and again, because these are some of the most engaged people within the climate movement, um, you know, and, and I think that there are intersections between doom is, doomism and climate anxiety, um, you know, I think we should get a better handle of what the long-term impacts are of these beliefs in terms of, you know, potentially delaying action. We do know from psychology, which has researched um, decision-making in lots of other contexts, including the environment, that fear appeals usually don't work. Um, they tend to cause people to shut down. Um, they get people to disengage because they become mo immobilized by their anxiety. So there, there is some suggestion that, you know, waking people up to some extent is is important. Um, it, it raises awareness, but that awareness doesn't necessarily translate into action, right? And that's what we want. We want, we don't just want people to care about climate change, we want them to do something about it. Um, and so, uh, you know, there has been some interesting work also that's out of the the, the Yale program on communication. Um, Jen Marlin had a paper that came out last year that looked at the role of hope versus fear appeals and it turns out that you know giving people lots of hope isn't the answer either because people just sort of displace that responsibility right like oh someone else will save us they'll take care of the problem and so what you need to do is not just convince people that climate change is real and its impacts are are going to be you know damaging and devastating but you need to give them somewhere to go with that you need to give them uh, again, the sense of agency and the belief that their actions will matter. And so you, you have to pair these two things together. And this idea of, of just shocking or scaring people into action, which is where a lot of this doomist framework kind of emerges from, uh, it doesn't seem to work, right? And so it's not, it's not a good strategy. One of the biggest problems that I see in this doomist framework is that it forces a binary of no return, you know, any hard limit beyond which we have total civilizational apps, you know, that's a yes or no scenario. Is everything great? Or does it all far, fall apart? Do, do we die? Right. And the problem with binaries is that they are incredibly difficult to push back against. I've experienced this in, you know, on Twitter and in other kinds of spaces where someone says, you know, in seven years, if we don't hit this target, it's game over for planet Earth, right? And believing that with full sincerity. And if I say, okay, well, no, it's actually not that bad. Then the, the first thing, you know, people do is say, wow, you're downplaying the climate crisis. Um, and so I have found myself going from being 
yelled at and told that I'm, a, you know, I'm making up climate change just for the grant money to being told that I'm in crisis because of grant dollars or my, you know, the status quo, um, you know, you know, whatever structure structures I represent as a, as a member of the community. Um, and there's this, there's this growing skepticism and even hostility towards scientists who are engaging in, in these spaces um, because we're trying to correct these narratives which came out of science, often our own science in many cases, is now being sort of thrown back at us. And we're being told, you know, because it's been translated through these filters of, you know, the media and of, you know, um, um, who, who are then saying, okay, now these scientists are not trustworthy because they're trying to tell us the problem is not as bad as we think. Um, and saying it's not as bad as you think sounds like you're downplaying, you know, people's anxieties, your impacts. And so that's the problem with binary, right? There's a lot of space between we're fine and we're doomed. And that space, I would argue, is our greatest asset, right? Because that allows us to take actions to choose, you know, to some extent, the climate future of our choosing. There was a really great uh, study that came out last year that showed, you know, the best case scenarios for our climate futures are off the table now, but so are the worst case scenarios. And so we still have a lot of, you know, wiggle room in terms of, all right, how bad do we want things to get? And if we can't push back on apocalyptic doomist narratives, um, we, ju we just don't have the skills to do that, I would argue, without making it sound like we're downplaying the climate crisis um, for, you know, which plays into, you know, conspiracy thinking models that, you know, we have been able to fight when it comes to oil, um, but when it comes to, you know, people who we agree with about the climate crisis, that is a challenge that we want to deal with, and that's a growing challenge. And so, you know, breaking down these binaries is tough. And so, so what do we do? <laughs> and so, um, I would say that, you know, for me, where I've been trying to push back on this is, it, uh, is you know, one of my biggest goals when it comes to public health, which is this idea of harm reduction, right? So harm reduction is of health, um, like the things like, um, teen sex, uh, the HIV crisis, um, and drug addiction, right? So these are some examples where prevention through abstinence-only education is a good model. We know that telling people to abstain or to avoid risky behaviors doesn't work um, for lots of reasons because, you know, because we're human beings um, and, and we're just not wired that way for biology or psychology or social conditioning, um, you know, many, many reasons. You know, teens are going to have sex. Um, you can't just tell people who are in at-risk populations, uh, you know, that HIV is is a danger. So, you know, you should just abstain. Um, and telling addicts, you know, just to go cold turkey and not to take drugs. You know, in the end, all that does is stigmatize those things. People go into hiding. The behaviors go underground, and outcomes are worse for for everyone, right? Especially for those who are most at risk. And so, the harm reduction model basically says, okay, well, instead of preaching abstinence, what we're going to do is we're going to make it as safe as possible for people to engage in those behaviors. We're going to provide them with the tools that they need. Um, and we're, you know, going to, we're not going to tell them to preach abstinence anymore, right? And that has much better public health outcomes overall than if you just tell people not to do those things that are risky, right? And we've actually seen the same exact things happening uh, during the pandemic, incidentally, right? This sort of um, abstinence only model of everyone stay in your home all the time and never leave, um, you know, has has been a complete disaster from a public health standpoint, um, rather than giving people, you know, recognizing that people have a need for human connection, and that we need to give people safer ways to do that. Um, and also, you know, providing them with the resources and the materials so that their needs are met, so they're able to do that. So how does that play into climate change? Well, the first thing that we have to do is you know, we have to avoid this this idea of an all or nothing binary. You can't just prevent by abstinence, right? And so in this case, it's, you know, we don't just stick with this narrative of 1.5 degrees or nothing, right? If we don't meet these targets, we're not engaging anymore. It's game over, right? I would argue it's the same kinds of binary, even though the metaphor, it's, it's not like a, an exact metaphor for something like, you know, heroin addiction or teen sex, right? Um, but the, and the important thing is that, you know, these harm reduction frameworks recognize that risk and vulnerability aren't shared equally because we already know that harm has happened. A no harm scenario comes to climate change 
is impossible because we already know that people have lost their lives, people have lost their homes, you know, um, climate change is already impacting communities. It's just impacting, you know, the marginalized, it's impacting people in the global south, it's impacting the most vulnerable communities, communities of color. Um, those aren't the communities that necessarily make the headlines, right? And so acknowledging that harm has already happened means that you can turn around and say, okay, anything that we do to prevent future harm will be worth it. Right? There is no point of harm point of no return past which action on climate change is pointless. It will always be worth acting, right? And so what I tell people or what I try to tell people is, you know, don't give up. There's not a point of no return. Um, anything that we can do will make things better for future generations. Um, and, you know, liken it to other social justice movements, right? Um, the, uh, um, the civil rights movement, for example, like, you know, that's not a fight any of us would ever expect to be won in a short time or within one generation. Um, these movements are long term, they take time. Um, and, you know, all I can never can never like the best I can hope for is not to solve this problem, right? But the best I can hope for is to make the world a better place for my children and my grandchildren, right? To 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 minimize future harm and current harm, right? And so if you appeal to people on that level, um, and you know, drawing from other kinds of you know similar movements that are that we know are long term and are but are still worth that fight, you know, hearkening back to Mary Heglar's point that home is always worth it. Um, you know, I think that can break through some of this um this wall because you know the reason people come to these demonstrative frameworks is because you know often they are anxious they are afraid and you have to validate that you have to acknowledge i get it i get that you're scared um there's a good reason to be scared this is a scary problem but it won't always be worth fighting for and then um i want to take a moment just to say you know the lone climate hero is a poor model uh, the media keeps propping up the same individuals, you know, this idea of, you know, the the one, the one guy, it's usually a guy who's the only person who is completely, you know, awakened to this challenge of climate change and why won't anyone listen to him and he's just going to fight it and, and, and it's this sort of embattled lone climate hero um, that sort of reinforces this idea of individualism, which has been incredibly damaging because it's not just individualism in terms of, you know, us as individuals, we have to give, we haven't, if we just give up enough, we can solve this problem. Um, that, you know, I think positions us in this really poor way um, in terms of the, you know, in individuals versus structural problems, right? Because you either see people saying, why aren't you giving up meat? Why are you still flying? Why are you, you know, why are you having kids? Like, why are you making these choices? Um, you're not giving up enough. And then people feel like this is too much for me. I can't do this on my own. Like, I can't give up all of these things. I've given up so much and this is still a problem. You know, that's not a, pos a position that anyone can really come to this movement with, you know, their whole sustainable selves, um, which isn't to say that individual actions don't matter. We do know that, you know, small actions can lead to bigger actions and bigger actions, right? They can build capacity, but individual actions can are only powerful when they're part of collectives, right? They have to be, um, you know, they have to be for your own sustainability. They have to be sort of entry ways for you to continue to engage more deeply. Um, it's def it's not a one and done scenario, right? Just if you only just made the right combination of choices, then you'd be able to solve climate change. And that's true whether we're talking about an individual teen activist or an individual scientist, right? This sort of idea of lone climate heroes, you know, needs to go away. Um, and um, and the other reason that this is that, that, that this is really damaging is that oftentimes the the people uh, and the lone climate heroes who focus on individual actions, you know, they won't even mention the structural problems that are limiting our our ability to make you know greener or more climate friendly actions or choices, right? Like I live in rural Maine. I don't have public transportation. I don't have the option of of taking the bus. I'm limited in terms of you know what you know, the ways that I can heat my home. Um, and that doesn't mean that I, I don't belong in this space. It just means that there are structural problems that, you know, my elderly neighbor has that that limit the choices that she's able to make. Um, and we also can't discount the role of the fossil fuel industry, right? I'm seeing this emerging narrative that, oh, if only the climate scientists would stop flying, then we would have action on climate change. And that is something that just, that, you know, it, it's, it's, it completely 
ignores the role that the fossil fuel industry has had in controlling the conversation, right? And I think it kind of feeds into um, the, the very thing that, um, you know, got us here in the first place, right? This overemphasis on these individual models. And so I think instead, what we need to do is learn from environmental justice and the sort of more recent climate justice movement, which you know, comes directly out of decades and centuries of social justice, that our climate movements need to be explicitly you know, feminist and anti-racist, um, and that they need to build coalitions so that we're not just focusing on you know, individual solutions or pretending that there's nothing we can do because the structural barriers are too large, right? Coalitions can be incredibly powerful. We shouldn't give up our power as individuals, uh, you know, as elections, right? So thinking about whether we're talking things like striking or voting um, or protesting, right? All of those are things that we can do um, as, you know, as collectives. Um, but as part of that, you know, we can, that it's easier to tackle structural problems from a collective perspective and also prioritizing the vulnerable, right? We're doing mutual aid. We're taking care of people in our communities. We're recognizing that we don't all share the risks of, of climate change, you know, equally, right? And so instead of, you know, an individual going on a hunger strike, maybe think about ways of organizing um, so that you are making sure that the people, you know, the displaced migrant workers in your community have enough food to eat, right? Like there are, there are different frameworks where we can, you know, think about, you know, about addressing the climate crisis from more of a climate justice perspective rather than the sort of individual lone hero perspective. Um, and so, in terms of ways forward, this is where this is where the climate muskox comes comes into play. And I think that the muskox as an animal, you know, we used to talk about climate hawks or doves. You know, how how aggressive should we be about climate action? That framework has completely disappeared. Um, as you know, the the evidence of climate change has become you know you know been brought to the fore. Like there's no longer any sense that we shouldn't do something about climate change. You know, within most of the members of the climate community. Um, and so. So I actually had this series of tweets in 2019, kind of responding to this idea of, of doom versus hope um, and sort of being really alarmed that I had a growing number of people emailing me, asking me if, you know, if there's even any point in having kids, you know, I'm hearing more and more from youth that are worried about, you know, whether they'll get to grow up. And, you know, this is sort of the, the landscape that, you know, that people are occupying right now. And so, for me, the the muskox is a is a good um, sort of symbolic solution to that for several reasons, and it kind of embodies a lot of the things that I've been talking about. Um, the first is that muskox are incredibly resilient. Um, from an ice age perspective, you know, where we lose our woolly mammoths and our um, mastodons and, and horses, and uh, here in North America at least, and our camels, um, you know. The, the musk ox survives, right? It is it is a surviving ice age megafauna that has persisted in the face of the extinction of of you know most of the large animals on on our planet. Um, so it persists and is resilient through time, but it's also resilient you know in the winter time, right? Like they will stand in the harsh Arctic winter, not even moving in some cases for days at a time, um, and they're just to me just this wonderful symbol of of absolute stubbornness um, in the face of uh, of adversity, right? And, um, you know, for some people, hope is a good motivator. For other people, they find hope, you know, to be really flimsy. It sort of implies someone else might come to um, or Pollyanna-ish in the face of, of, of everything that we know about the climate crisis. Um, whereas, you know, maybe, you know, as you know, as Amy Westerfeld has said, maybe we need climate rage, or as Kate Marple said, you know, maybe we need, you know, climate stubbornness. And all of those things, I think, are are kind of embodied in this idea of muskox. Like, fine, you know, this is happening. I'm not going to deny my reality, but I'm not going anywhere, right? I'm going to I'm going to persist in the face of this because what other do I have, right? I'm not giving up. Um, secondly, the 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 muskox is matriarchal, like many large herbivores. Um, you know, information is passed down from generation to generation through uh, through the females, um, and I'll say matriarchal in a biological sense. I know that word has different definitions, sort of in a social sense. Um, but, but 
power decision making in these matriarchal animal communities is sort of centered among among the the, the females. Um, and so this idea that you know we need new models of feminist climate leadership that kind of get away from this sort of lone patriarchal individualistic model. Um, you know, and when I say feminist, I mean intersectionally feminist, right? Not just white feminism. And so um, you know where we are bringing diverse voices to the table. We are changing the ways in which we make decisions so that we are, you know, emphasizing um, the, you know, the we're hearing from and listening from members of the community. Um, we are envisioning, uh, you know, ways that we can take care of each other. Um, you know, we are supporting the most vulnerable. Um, and it's not just sort of this idea of, you know, constant growth, um, uh, you know, technological solutions. Um, you know, silver bullets, you know, it's, you know, this approach to the climate crisis that is, um, you know, really different. It's, it's more, it's more community-based, it's more collective, um, and, you know, is, it, it brings uh, marginalized voices to the table, um, and, you know, uplifts women and girls, um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a different way of doing things than, we, you know, than we have done for, the you know, the last, you know, eight to 10,000 years in most cultures. Um, and so this, you know, idea of climate muskox as, uh, you know, sort of to me rem reminds me like, you know, we need a new model of feminist leadership in the climate conversation that fights back against these doomist narratives. And most of the voices that I see that are out there, you know, are, you know, the names that I've been sharing with you are women um, and people of color, right? They're, they're people who come out of indigenous communities, um, black, you know, the uh, black feminist uh, science, science fiction authors, um, and, you know, others who are, who are bringing th new perspectives to the table, or the perspectives aren't new, but they're new sort of on the, on the, um, within the broader climate conversation. And so that's where sort of, I, you know, I look for inspiration and for leadership uh, in terms of where, where we should go next. And thirdly, just sort of emphasizing this idea of collectives, um, this is what I like to call the circular phalanx of badassery, right? So when when the muskoks are threatened, they will stand with their heads facing outwards, and the young or the vulnerable, the sick, elderly, are all in the center, right? So there's a large circle here. This is their their kind of classic formation. You can even see a little baby head poking out. Um, and, you know, so if a predator comes along or something strange or unusual happens, um, the muskox form up, right? And a lot of uh, ungulates will do this. Um, a lot of herd animals will do this. And, you know, this is a way of, you know, working together to protect those who are most vulnerable among, among us. Um, and the sort of idea of, you know, acting as a community I should say here, you know, these are all the females, like the males are wandering off by themselves. Um, you know, this this idea of collective action and working together, coalition building, um, is I think something that is 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 very much needed. We don't what we don't need are more individuals coming in from outside, um, trying to tell people who've been doing this work for decades, here's what we need to do, here's how it's done, right? And we see too much of that happening. Um, so overall, I would say, um, you know, the muskox is a good model model here for combating this kind of climate dynamism, this sort of stubbornness, um, this, you know, care for others, especially the most vulnerable, recognizing that our, our contributions to the climate crisis are differential, right? And so for some, just some quick ways forward, um, I would say people often ask me, what can we do? What are, you know, what comes next? I would say tell your climate story, right? The, the power of storytelling is really important um, in this space. Um, and it helps us as we as we tell stories, we can start to visualize what we want and what what needs to be different. And we need to actively draw roadmaps towards those new futures. Um, but to do that, we also need to know our histories. We need to know where we came from and the structural problems that got us here in the first place, including white supremacy, um, you know, capitalism. We can't make the same mistakes that and repeat those. We call this in the climate crisis. Um, we need to be joining collectives. So, in the organization, there are ground and join them and listen and pitch in. Don't try academics. You know, we have a tendency to think that we're the um, smartest people in the room, right? We need to be leaders in these spaces. Um, there are activists who have been dealing with these kinds of issues for decades or longer. Um, we need to be listening to them. We need to be rejecting and breaking down binary thinking, right? And sort of uh, speaking 
from more of a, a continuum perspective when it comes to harms and impacts to reinforce this idea that it's not too late. It's never too late. Um, and as part of that, we need to uplift diverse narratives. So those of us who have platforms, uh, you know, we need to be uplifting the voices who have been marginalized from the communities that have been hurt in this space. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank you for your time and attention. And uh, hopefully we have seen that was a, I actually have no idea if I've gone away over time. So I hope not. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, we are actually actually at 101 right now. So um, amazing seminar. I'm really happy. No, no, don't apologize. I'm really happy to be able to record the whole thing. Um, because I think there are people who are going to want to watch this or watch it again. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, for people who are able to, some people have to leave because it's one o'clock, but if you're willing to stay and answer questions and chat for a bit, I'm going to keep the recording going uh, so that we reserve all that because the time limit is just on people's hour, but it's not necessarily on the recording. Well, so, I'm, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry about that too, because I know your time is all really val valuable and I love to have time for questions. So it, please email uh, me if you didn't get a chance to, I'll, if you have to leave. I'll speak for myself. I thought it was a phenomenal presentation and I'm going to open the floor to questions. And we actually have one that was posed a little bit earlier. I'm just going to start with that one and let people unmute themselves. But Thirandi had a question uh, that was in the chat. I'm going to just ask Thirandi if you're still here to speak. Hi. Um, so first of all, I just want to tell you, Dr. Uh, thank you so much for the amazing presentation. This is definitely very informative. Um, as a freshman undergraduate student who's just getting into um, this whole climate change movement and trying to see how she can fit in, this was very uh, informative. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us. Um, so my question is, earlier you were speaking about how abstinence is a failed model and how instead we should try to teach people how to do certain things safely. So when you brought this up, I remember that you brought up COVID and how governments are asking everyone to stay inside and never go out. According to this harm reduction principle, what are some strategies that you would recommend for people to combat COVID and to keep not only themselves safe, but others safe as well without the standard methods we currently live by, such as by not going outside, uh, staying within six feet of other people, wearing a mask in public and limiting public gatherings. What do you think are other ways that um, kind of follow the harm reduction principle? That's a great question. Um, I'm not a public health person, but I, I'm gonna try to answer that really quickly just because I think, you know, it's helpful for me too to know what the limits of that, uh, you know, that framework are in terms of a, a being a metaphor. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'll say that, you know, as, as a person who has a high risk condition, um, I have really not left my house in a year, right? So I have been taking that super seriously because for my anxiety, that's been my way of sort of mitigating that, right? Um, but I also have a really good friend who, you know, lives on the other side of town who lives alone. And so for her, this has been extremely isolating and difficult. And so I'm really fortunate to, you know, I've got my partner, I have my dog, um, you know, I, I already had strong uh, internet support networks, you know, through social media, through, you know, I, I hang out with my friends, I play Dungeons and Dragons via, you know, Zoom already, you know, going into this pandemic. And so I think, you know, from that perspective, you could say, you know, I already had support systems in place. And so for, for folks like my friend, you know, isolation in some cases could have been more more d damaging to her health um, than engaging in you know some kinds of social activities in ways that are you know are safe safer for her right and so you know her having to decide whether or not those risks are worth it um, it shouldn't be up to her as an individual right we should what we should do is we should as a society as um, you know our governments should have been coming up with ways of making it so that people could spend time outside together. Um, in ventilated spaces, right? Even here in the winter time, or you know, making sure that we had the the right infrastructure to be able to support people. And you know, so for folks who are really isolated, like senior citizens who might not be able to even go to the store and get their groceries um, without their family members coming to see them um, and help them, you know, what what are they going to do, right? And so, I think I think where where the where it relates to COVID and climate, this idea of harm reduction. Uh, models from public health. Um, it's it's not just it's not just a matter of um, 
you know, the, the abstinence only model doesn't work because what I'm not, I'm not trying to say that like, we should just fuels because burning fossil fuels doesn't work, right? But what that means is, you know, we need to understand the ways in which people's choices are constrained by the options we give them. We need to not ask people to completely change their behaviors without supporting them and, and, and caring for their needs, right? Um, you know, people who can't feed their families uh, don't need to be told that they're, they're, they need to go vegan, right? If they're, um, if, you know, if your SNAP benefits don't, don't cover, um, you know, the, the same kinds of, you know, food that we think people should be eating, like local organic, um, you know, if, if I can't use my food stamps at the, at the farmer's market, or that money doesn't take me as far, you know, is that really an accessible choice for everyone, right? And so that's where I think these, these kinds of perspectives are, are valuable. It's sort of making sure that before we criticize people's choices, we understand what their motivations are, we have compassion for them, and we make sure we're providing them with the frameworks and the resources that they need to be successful, instead of just getting upset that they fail from the, from the get-go. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your question. So we have another question from Anisha. Anisha, do you want to unmute and ask your question or make your statement? Yeah, sure. Hi, Dr. Gill. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. It was super informative and I loved the symbol of the muskox. Um, I just had a question about, um, so while I completely agree that, that the Dumas narrative that you spoke about is harmful for the general public, especially those who are um, already anxious and concerned, um, but uh, wouldn't you think that the Dumas narrative is in a way useful to push governments and institutions towards taking action? That's a really good question. And one thing I've wondered about, um, you know, what is it that so, so this is where I think we have a knowledge gap where some research would be useful, especially folks who research decision making. Um, because, you know, if the Dumas narrative gets people out in the streets, you know, so we have people who engage in groups like Extinction Rebellion um, or these youth, the, the, the youth climate movements and the youth climate protests, you know, which we think have actually have, have been pretty successful um, in, you know, like just thinking about the ways in which climate change was a, a part of the last election in ways that it wasn't here in the US, um, you know, then you could argue that, yeah, it is, you know, is a potentially a benefit, right? At the same time, one thing I wonder about is, you know, what's the long-term sustainability there? And as we blow past that seven, you know, when that seven-year clock ticks down, right? If we blow past that, that moment, will we see a collapse of, of these movements because people feel disenfranchised? Um, and, you know, Nathaniel Stinnett here in the U.S. has done a lot of research on um, through the Environmental Voter Pro Project that, that looks at uh, the sort of uh, different beliefs and voting habits. And they've found that environmental people who care a lot about the environment tend not to show up at the polls. They don't vote. Um, and, you know, young people tend to vote less than um, older generations. Um, and so that's, you know, that's changing or has changed a little bit in the, in the last election. Um, but it's still, it's still the case that, you know, overwhelmingly people who care the most about the environment tend not to show up to the polls. And I'm not saying that voting is the only, you know, way that we can engage in these spaces or make change positively. But I think that we do have some good information out there about people's long-term behaviors and activities. And I think it would be really helpful for us to have a better handle on these, on the impacts of these narratives, right? Do they, what happens when a protest doesn't work, right? Um, thinking about the Wisconsin Capitol protests, which were happening when I was in graduate school, um, you know, where we were out there for months and months at a time, and then everything just kind of went away. Um, and, you know, or the, um, Occupy Wall Street movement, right? So there, there are limits, I think, to to getting out into the streets, and in terms of you know whether those actually have any long term impacts, uh, or you know versus short term impacts in the moment and sort of meeting a little demands. I, and so, you know, I don't know enough about the 
the the long term effectiveness of these these sorts of um, you know direct actions to know whether and I don't know if we know whether or not these are going to actually play a role um, in, in changing policy you know and, and getting you know I, especially from the the perspective of youth movements I think they've been pretty pretty effective um, they shouldn't let up they shouldn't stop but um, you know, but my biggest worry again is in the long-term sustainability, um, is in the sort of broader group of people who are maybe alarmed but not going out and protesting, right? Um, they feel sort of immobilized um, by, by their climate anxiety. And also I'm really, really, really worried that we might be setting ourselves up for a really disenfranchised group of, of young people where we blow past these targets and without, without the desired outcomes, um, and then people just say, you know what, forget it. I'm done. I can't, I can't be, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to live my life. And, you know, before tomorrow we die. Right. And, and that I have. Um, and so we need, to, we need to be very thoughtful always about our motives, what our goals are. Um, and this is where engaging with, you know, really savvy activist communities who have been fighting for social justice for, you know, a really long time, you know, they're very thoughtful about what they want, about what their outcomes are. Um, and so learning lessons from those communities, I think, can help us um, because, yeah, because I do worry. I worry about the longevity of the movement. Thank you. Dawn. Thank you. Hi, Jacqueline. It's really nice to see you. Um, uh, so, um, I, I said that, that I have a question, but this might be a little bit more of a comment, a, a little bit responding to what Anisha was just um, adding to the conversation. And I guess, um, as I was listening to your talk, one of the things that came up for me is environmental history and um, the kind of history of um, the idea of purity in um in environmentalism and um and wilderness and how it seems like the um uh climate doomism or and some some kind of flavors of um uh, of this approach to to um, activism do perpetuate a similar kind of sense of purity uh, about like these either ors, these binaries, and I'm wondering if, um, and and that definitely has a very weight history. Um, that's um, in part about the erasure of indigenous peoples from particular areas, um, and seeing like our our big national parks as unpeopled, and uh, also um, big wildlife reserves in other parts of the world as being unpeopled. And um, and so I, I'm wondering if you see a through line um, in terms of whiteness and purity and these um, kind of current trends in the way that climate activism and climate discourse is um, is kind of framing the issue. Yeah, I definitely do, um, and it, and it, it makes me think a little bit of um, uh, sort of uh, what. Uh, Tuck and Yang talk about in their decolonization is not a metaphor about this sort of movement to innocence, right? Like um, this this idea of of you know idealizing idealizing uh, practices or approaches that seem like like this is where this is where deep, deep adaptation comes from, right? Like you're idealizing these practices and life ways that surficially seem to be drawn a lot on indigenous lifeways and practices while completely ignoring the indigenous communities that that you're kind of borrowing or lifting from um and 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 sort of lit or or idealizing some you know like think about like the paleo food movement right like you're sort of idealizing some non-existent almost um uh, mythical past uh, or pure or ideal past um, where we lived in perfect harmony, you know, and by we, you know, sort of, again, erasing the the vast array of different, you know, cultures and, and ways of engaging, you know, with the environment um, through different kinds of diets, right? Like, so, so saying like, you, you know, you should be vegan, um, you know, ignores uh, 
you know, large parts of the world where that's not possible because of the ecologies of those places, um, you know, uh, you know, places like the Arctic or, um, you know, places where people rely, you know, in drylands where there's a lot of pastoralism, right? And so, um, so there's sort of this, this weird, like, uh, um, idealization of these, you know, what they'll, they even call primitive, I'm using their language, life ways, um, while also being completely ignorant about them and also ignorant about um, the ways in which, you know, indigenous land uses have been, you know, sustainable, and yet indigenous peoples have been completely marginalized, um, you know, from from these landscapes. And and a lot of, and a lot of the like, this what's 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 tricky here is there there are, to to get back to your question about whiteness, there are I wanted to talk about this, but I did, I couldn't I didn't fit it in. Um, but but there are very there's there's only there there are not very many steps between this idea of like our, our eco anxiety and and eco fascism right you start to see people talking about population control again that's coming up again in the narratives and when we talk about population control or immigration those anxieties are always um, directed at you know brown and black bodies um, as you know being overpopulating um, where it's you know it's not about population. Uh, it's about consumption, right? And so, um, so there's there's a very fine line, um, and a lot of the deep adaptation rhetoric starts to drift into ecofascism, you know, or or there's a lot of dog whistling that's that's happening, and there is a there is a rising ecofascist movement um, that comes, you know, out of some of these anxieties about over, you know overpopulation and about um, uh, uh, yeah, and so I would and 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 immigration too, immigration policy. So these things are all connected, right? Um, and so I think that's you know the sort of lack of self reflectiveness leads us down, and and also again the the lack of diversity in the voices that are dominating the conversation just reinforces these things, right? And it's it's not they're not new, like you said, um, but they um, I think you know they you can kind of trace that through line back to you know this sort of you know, sort of almost Teddy Roosevelt sort of model of like, of what nature is, right? And, um, and what our relationship of that should be like, um, or with, with nature should be like. So yeah, so I, I think there's, I think there's a lot there that, you know, those, I think those connections are definitely there. And they're, you know, these things, these practices, these ideas are not ahistorical, right? They, they're, they, they're, there are through lines through, through time. Um, and, you know, they are playing out and in, in with these sort of emerging, like I said, eco-fascist narratives that are really damaging and harmful. And um, when you, yeah, when you find yourself on the same side as, as, as Nazis, you should probably rethink, you know, what, what your politics are, right? So. so. Thank you so much. It was a, it's a really great talk. And I think, um, like, as a person who does environmental history and thinks about the history of whiteness and the environmental movement and how that like there have always been people of color environmental activists always yeah. Yeah. and they're just not like part of that story yeah. um that that gets told about like john muir and and that group of folks um so it it really makes sense but it makes it um uh difficult to think about like how do you purge that from yeah. like environmental movements because it's been around since the 1800s um when we've had environmental movements there have been people who like it's uh i'm in my child's room and the, there's a copy of the lorax sitting here and i'm like yeah. that guy, the lorax is such a jerk <laughs> yeah and like and how do you do it i mean like I was, I'm still figuring out how to do this, but like I, as I was telling that story of like, these are the moments, right? Like those are the moments that are on like a subset of people's radar, right? Like that's not, that wasn't the whole story or even the most important story, but you know, from, in terms of the rise of, you know, the, the events that are contributing to the rise of doomism, you know, it's, I think it's not a coincidence that some of the biggest doomists live in the Bay Area and only started caring about climate change when the, you know, the California wildfires got really bad, hmm. right? That's when we start to see, oh, now suddenly it's a catastrophe. It wasn't a catastrophe when it was Tuvalu. It wasn't a catastrophe, you know, when it was, you know, you know, drought in China, like those, those things don't matter, right? Now it matters because it's my backyard. Um, and yeah, and so that's just my hypothesis, but um, it's, you know, it's striking to me. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is so interesting. And I, I don't know if you're headed toward like publishing 
um, a version of this, but it, it seems yeah. like a, it's a really valuable um, uh, set of observations that I think could move us in a good direction, or at least some of us in a good direction. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to talk to you more about what to do with this. Yeah, so. Yeah. So um, I actually want to ask, not as I to ask a question, but engage you on this for, for just a minute. I, I um, as as luck would have it, I'm going to be talking about this topic in my 100 level physical geography class yes. tomorrow. Okay. Um, and uh, so I did invite them. Some of them actually uh, were attending, but I will recommend the recording to them. Um, I always ask the students when I start that conversation. I no longer ask them what they think about climate change. I just ask them, do you have friends or family? Who don't believe in climate change. And mm -hmm. as of the most recent time I asked that question, which was last spring, a large fraction of the class still have friends and family who are don't believe in it. So I don't quite believe that it's only that eight percent. But setting that aside for the moment, the students most I agree with you, the students are mostly there. And so the, the issue is always how do you combat that sort of cynicism? And I will I will say that your the, the philosophy you've espoused is very much uh, where I come from as well, but I don't get as much into the policy because it's a physical science course. But what I do say to them is, well, you could call this doomist, but it can always be worse than what you think it is. Mm -hmm. And so there's always an obligation to do what you can to try to get it from getting as bad as it could be. And uh, frankly, I have two grand granddaughters, you know, they're four years old, and 18 months. And so it's like, you don't have the right to give up. Yeah. Because you've got an obligation. Yeah. Um, um, and so I say to students, you guys have the power to make a difference on this. You can't stop it from happening. But the most important thing I can do is to convince you that you as responsible informed citizens have political voice. And it's always been the case that people who exercise that voice have the greatest probability of actually making some difference. You don't necessarily make the difference, but like you said, working with other people. The other thing I'm going to add is this, I'm going to quote a Jewish text, um, which I always call on whenever anything like this comes up. And it's it's from a it's from a text called Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers. And the quote is, you are not obligated to complete the task, but neither are you free to desist from it. Wow. That's my answer every time one of these things comes up. You, you don't have the moral right to give up, but you also don't have, uh, but, 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 you have to be realistic. You, you you do your part. You do what you can, and so I, that to me is kind of a fundamental lesson. It gets away from a lot of the other complexities, but that's kind of my my approach to this. I love um, that. Yeah, it looks like Don has a thought. I have a thought too, but Don, you go first. Well, Andy, I was going to say that like that if that uh, the the Y triple C, which is the the Yale Climate Change Communication Center. Um, survey is correct. Like you can, eight percent. You would still have plenty of students uh, uh, saying that they're relatives. But the thing, the the other statistic for, or the other um, finding from the Yale climate change um, surveys that's really interesting and that Maggie and I act on in our climate change class is that very few people have conversations about climate change. Right, and I think that actually gets to a bit of of Jacqueline's point that like it's not like one or the it's not like uh, the alarmist or the um, or the people who are alarmed or the people who are um, who are denying still like there's there's just so much in between, and and the, the way you get to the next stage of people getting involved is to like actually be talking about it. And it's I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head from the last um, study, but it's a pretty small number of people who have like regular conversations with another human being about climate change. <laughs> and I think if we're talking about it more, it, you actually like that's a really good space for um, for making change. And so Maggie and I are making our students have a conversation with someone and then report back about it. And so yeah. I wonder if you should be asking your students that, like, when is the last time you had a conversation about I someone outside? That's <laughs> a great question. I will answer yeah. that question. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I would say, too, like the 8% dismissive, that's not, uh, you know, they, they, they basically, what they do is they kind of push back against this idea of like, 
you know, it's not a yes or no on climate. There's six, that's why they call it six Americas. You know, you, it feels like we're in two Americas. Like I believe in climate change. I don't believe in climate change, but really it's more complex than that. And so, you know, like those, those disengaged people, they're not actively hostile. They may not believe in climate change, but they're just like, it's not relevant. It doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. And then there's the doubtful that are like, no, nah, it's probably, I probably don't. Right. Like they sort of ask these really targeted questions and that doubtful group is bigger. Um, so if you, you know, if you add up that group, it's probably closer to something like 20%, you know, who aren't concerned, alarmed, uh, you know, they're, they're the that, that other half, but they are a minority. But what's interesting is if you ask the public about scientific consensus, excuse me, they still think it's 50, 50. They still think 50. Show them that slide, the show yeah. Them which is like, oh my gosh, that's what we're up, you know, we're up against a lot. Um, and you know, a lot of that comes out of decades of sort of fair and balanced reporting or whatever, but yeah. Um, I would say, you know, Don's to Don's point about talking about climate change, you know, Catherine Hayhoe says that, you know, the, the when people ask her what can I do the most important thing is to talk about it right and um and so I think that you know just making it part of our discussion is important but also you know I think that we do need a way of to differentiate between doomism and and despair and grief right because some of this comes out of despair and grief and some of it doesn't um and you know, especially get, coming up with a, a set of tools for people to manage their grief and, and not feel isolated and alone. And that comes through talking about it, right? A lot of people just feel like this is, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm alone. This is too big for me by myself. Right. And so we need, we need people to talk about it. Um, I, the other thing I didn't talk about in this that I wanted to was the, the, there is some research on climate literature, climate fiction, and it does show it, it's interesting. It does. It doesn't seem to raise awareness much because it's mostly read by people who are already worried about climate change. So it doesn't seem to be expanding the, you know, or changing belief. Um, it does. May, it, it maybe galvanizes people short term, which sort of shows that we do need to keep exposing them to those messages. You know, we we um, we, we need to keep having the conversations, but especially among young people, it tends to just increase negative associations with climate change. Not to say that like climate change is bad, but just it makes them feel bad personally. And so again, you know, we're still stuck, I think, in this model of awareness raising while failing to provide any kind of roadmap or actions, right? Like we, we need to be empowering people. So I've been talking to more and more uh, biology educators who are, you know, hearing this in their classrooms, K through 12 classrooms, um, you know, college educators who are, you know, realizing this phenomenon sort of oh wait i don't actually need to devote my one day on climate change to convincing you it's real right um and so you know what we don't have is a good set of tools um both for the conversation but also for teaching um for you know what works in terms of getting students past that that sense of despair or anxiety um what what do we tell them to do right we can tell them to talk about it but what are some of some of the other things that we can tell them to do so the last thing I'll say is that what I always often communicate to students is uh, this is a pro this is an issue you're going to be dealing with for the rest of your lives, mm -hmm. and it's only going to accelerate. And so you don't have the option of ignoring it because it's going to come knocking on your door, which is not to say you should despair, but you need to be thinking about it because you're going to be dealing with it. Your children will be dealing with it. It's going to be a permanent feature. So you should educate yourself about it. I don't offer them a roadmap in terms of what to do other than to say you have a voice. I mean, the most important thing people can do other than talking to other people is advocate, right? For changing yeah, policy. Yeah. So yep. I'll just want uh, Michelle Moyer, who's no longer on the call, typed in, we didn't build this house, but we do live in it, which is, I think, a reference to something that uh, Isabel Wilkerson wrote in the book, Cast, about your responsibility to deal with, with uh, the caste system and racism. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, okay, I think we are, it is now just about 1 30. Does anybody have any last questions? I want to thank you for sticking around and this has been a really interesting conversation and uh, I'm going to stop the recording in just a moment. Anybody have any last comments they want to add before we close out? I'm not hearing any. I'm going to stop the recording, but actually, Jacqueline, if you have another minute, I want to ask you about the younger Dryas. <laughs> of course, sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to stop the recording now.